Welcome to High View Online. Although we can't be together in person right now, we can be together through technology and worship and gather as a community around the person of Jesus Christ. Church Online is a new thing for High View, but we are grateful for all the volunteers who are working hard to make these digital worship services possible. Today, Pastor Aaron will continue our series through Hebrews, Meeting Jesus Again, and we will also have an opportunity to gather around two families who are dedicating their children to God. It's gonna be a great day. We can't pass the offering baskets around this week, but if you would like to contribute financially to the ministry here at Highview, there are a number of different ways that you can do so, including pre-authorized giving, e-transfer, online giving through our website, and mailing your checks. Please visit our website, hcckw.ca, for more information. Just a reminder that if you're struggling to use online tools to connect during this time of physical distancing, help is on the way. You should have received an email last week about our new HCC Tech Help Team. This is a group of people you can call who can help you through some of your technological challenges, including how to use video chat, how to navigate a web page, how to make sure your camera and microphone is on on your computer and mobile device, and more. If you need help, we hope you'll make use of this great ministry opportunity. Easter weekend is going to look different this year, but we still want to celebrate Christ's death Christ's death and resurrection together. We need the hope of the resurrection more than ever in these difficult times. Please join us online Good Friday at 10.30 a.m. for a short time of remembering the hope of the cross through worship and communion. Yes, communion together. We ask that you come to the online service with some bread and juice of your own. Crackers and water work fine too, and we will celebrate Jesus' sacrifice together. Then plan to join us Easter Sunday for an online worship party celebrating Christ's triumph over sin and death. Even though we can't be together in person, we have so much to celebrate together. We hope you'll plan to join us. And now for something really special. This morning, we have two families who would like to dedicate their children, Heidi and Eric Munnings dedicating Adelaide and Star and Matt LaFranco dedicating Ivy. First up, Eric, Heidi, and Addie. Watch this. Okay, well, welcome everybody, especially welcome to Heidi and Eric and Adelaide. This is Highview's first ever online baby dedication. So this is going to look a little bit different than it would if we were live and in person, but um, God is still God and the church is still the church. So for those of you um, watching from your different home spaces. This would be, if we were gathered together, I would be explaining uh, what baby dedication is at Highview. So baby dedication is uh, in many ways a lot more about the parents than it is about the baby. It's about you, Eric and Heidi, and your commitment to uh, understand Addie as a gift from God and your commitment to raise her in the ways of Jesus to know who Jesus is, uh, to be familiar with the teachings of the church. So in some ways, this is a lot like um, a wedding and you're gonna be making some promises to Addie and in a public sort of way, albeit online, because that's a bit how life okay. kind of has to look right now. So Eric and Heidi uh, know all about the questions that they are gonna be asked. And afterwards, just like, um, like if we were live, they would respond, we do. So, you guys ready? Yes. yes. Okay. Eric and Heidi, do you acknowledge Adelaide as a gift from God and seek his help in raising her? We, we do. do. Do you promise as parents to bring Adelaide up in the knowledge of God and in the teachings of scripture and the Christian church? We, we do. do. Do you promise to model and live the teachings of Jesus Christ and to, pra uh, to practice, uh, sorry, let me start again. <laughs> do you promise to model and live the teachings of Jesus, the practice of prayer, and to guide her in the development of a Christ-like character? We, we do. do. Do you promise to the best of your ability to shape Addie's home life in such a way that it would feel natural and positive for her to make her own confession of Christ at the appropriate time, if she so chooses. We, we do. do. 
And now Eric and Heidi have a scripture that they would like to um, read on Addie's behalf. All right, this is Ephesians 3, 17 to 19, starting halfway through 17. <laughs> and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know that this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled <laughs> to the measure of all the fullness of God. Very good. Now, if we were live together in our building, uh, those of you watching this at home from your own living rooms and kitchens, this would normally be the place where I would invite you as the congregation to stand and for us to together corporately offer our support to Heidi and Eric, those of us who um, who are part of the church, those of us who are parents know that nobody raises children alone, it takes a village. Um, we can't do that in our normal kind of way uh, this morning, but God is still God and we are still the church, even each from our own homes. So what I'm gonna invite you to do is this, I'm still going to give you the same charge as a congregation that I would if we were live together in our building. Um, and then I will invite you to reach out to Heidi and Eric online, kind of with your affirmation, with your agreement that you will support them in their Christian parenting. So if you were live, you would respond to my charge with, we will. <laughs> and you can do that on um, social media, by email, maybe a text. Uh, and that's how we're going to offer our support to Eric and Heidi. Church, Highview Community Church. Do you promise to support Eric and Heidi in their Christian parenting of Adelaide? Offering and modeling faith, prayer, and the love of the Christian community? If so, please respond, we do. And Eric and Heidi will look forward to receiving those messages um, in the coming weeks. Let's just pray. Lord God, Thank you so much for the beautiful gift of Adelaide um, and Munnings. We are um, thrilled that you have blessed Heidi and Eric, that you have blessed our community with this little life. We ask that she would grow strong, uh, both in her physical body and also in her spirit. We thank you for, for giving her such wonderful parents, Eric and Heidi, we just ask that you would give them everything that they need. Parenting is not for the faint of heart, as I'm sure Heidi and Eric know already. Would you equip them? Would you give them the support, the love, the friendship that they will need to, um, to have strength for this journey? In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, this morning, uh, church at home got that much more awesome because we have not just one but two um, baby slash child dedications going on right now. We saw Eric and Heidi dedicate Addie just a couple of minutes ago and now uh, Matt and Star would like to uh, dedicate Ivy. So Matt and Star know of course that rather than um, any kind of commitment on Ivy's behalf, this is their commitment as parents your commitment, Matt and Star, to raise Ivy to, to know who Jesus is and um, to raise her in, in the Christian faith, in the Christian church. So uh, we're going to go through some of these questions similar to, to what we asked Eric and Heidi. And you will, you will give us your agreement by saying we do, a little bit like a wedding. But first, uh, mm -hmm. Matt had a scripture that he wanted to read um, over Ivy this morning. Yes, so it's Deuteronomy 6, 4, 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord with your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your house and on your gates. What a great 
um, kind of centering scripture for the task of Christian parenting. So Matt and Star, do you acknowledge Ivy as a gift from God and seek his help in raising her? We do. Do you promise as parents to bring Ivy up in the knowledge of God and the teachings of scripture and the Christian church? We do. We do. Do you promise to model and live the teachings of Jesus and the practice of prayer and guide Ivy in the development of a Christ-like character? We do. Do you promise to the best of your ability to shape Ivy's home life in such a way that it would feel natural, positive, and good for her to make her own confession of Christ at the appropriate time if she so chooses? We do. And um, High View Community Church, you you will be good at this by now because we just did this with Eric and Heidi. This is the time when if we were live in our own building, I would invite you to stand and we would acknowledge together um, our responsibility as friends, as the church, to come around Matt and Star and support them in their parenting. Uh, nobody can parent alone. We need our village. We need our church. So as we have done already with Eric and Heidi and their parenting of Addie, I will give you a charge, High View, and I will encourage you in the coming weeks to, to reach out to Matt and Star, whether on social media or email or text, and, and affirm your commitment. So here we go. This is a bit weird, but the world is weird now. So here we go. <laughs> High View Community Church, do you promise to support Matt and Star in their Christian parenting of Ivy? Do you promise to offer and model faith, prayer, and the love of the church? If so, please text or post or somehow reach out to Matt and Star with the words, we do. All right. We're almost done here. Um, Penny and Ivy have been very patient. i just like to pray for you guys, and, um, and then we'll be all done. Lord God, thank you so much for blessing Matt, Star, and Penny with the gift of Ivy into their family. I pray that she would grow uh, strong, strong physically and, and strong in, in her character, strong in the, in the person that you have called her to be. We pray that you would give Matt and Star all the strength, all the support, and all the friendship that they need to, to raise Ivy. We pray for Penny in her role as big sister to Ivy, that you would help her and that the girls would have a great friendship as they grow. Thank you so much for this wonderful gift. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey guys, welcome to Church on the Couch, which is what we're doing. Um, this season when we can't gather together. And today, my boys, Sir Micah and Sir Eli, and Mrs. Shadow. Mrs. Shadow are going to share a Bible story for you. This story is Bible from story. the <laughs> Jesus Storybook Bible, which is a great Bible for kids. This story is called The Captain of the Storm, which is a pretty good story to read right about now. So, you guys ready? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's start reading. I'm ready too. The sun was going down. The air was warm and still. Let's go across the lake, Jesus said to his friends. Now Jesus had been helping people all day, and he was tired. So they left the crowds at the shore and set out in a small fishing boat. Jesus climbed into the boat to take a nap. As soon as his head touched the pillow, he fell fast asleep. It was a beautiful evening. A gentle breeze rustled the sails. The friends were chatting happily as they headed out into the middle of the lake. Everything was perfect. Just right for a nice, quiet sail. They were only about halfway across when, out of nowhere, whirling winds swept across the lake, fierce and strong, like a hurricane. A blinding flash of lightning lit up the sky. Thunder roared right overhead. The storm blew the water into towering waves that hurled the little boat up, 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 
and then send it hurtling, crashing back down, down, down. The fishing boat was blown and buffeted and tossed and turned, back and forth and up and down and left and right and round and round. And in the middle of the storm, Jesus was sleeping. Now Jesus' friends had been fishermen all their lives, but in all their years fishing on this lake, they had never once seen a storm like this one. No matter how hard they struggled with their ropes and sails, they couldn't control their boat. This storm was too big for them. But the storm wasn't too big for Jesus. Help! They screamed, wake up, quick Jesus! Jesus opened his eyes, rescue us, save us! They shrieked, don't you care? Of course Jesus cared. And this was the very reason he had come, to rescue them and to save them. Jesus stood up and spoke to the storm. Hush, he said. That's all. And the strangest thing happened. The wind and the waves recognized Jesus' voice. They had heard it before, of course. It was the same voice that made them in the very beginning. They listened to Jesus, and they did what he said. Immediately, the wind stopped. The water calmed down. It glittered innocently in the moonlight and lapped quietly against the side of the boat as if nothing had happened. The little boat bobbed gently up and down. There was a deep stillness and a great quiet all around. Then Jesus turned to his wind-torn friends. Why were you scared? He asked. Did you, who for did you forget who I am? Did you believe your fears instead of me? Jesus' friends were quiet, as quiet as the wind and the waves. And into their hearts came a different kind of storm. What kind of man is this? They asked themselves anxiously. Even the wind and the waves obey him, they said, because they didn't understand. They didn't realize yet that Jesus was the Son of God. Jesus' friends had been so afraid they had only seen the big waves. They had forgotten that, if Jesus was with them, then they had nothing to be afraid of, no matter how small their boat or how big the storm. We're going to pray quickly, and then we'll say goodbye. Can you come closer? No. No? Okay. God, thank you for being with us, even if we're in the middle of what seems like a really big storm right now, and it feels like we're in a really little boat. Even though we can't be together on Sunday morning, I pray that we'd have a good day with our family, um, following the church online, um, having church on our couch. I just pray that you would continue to be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Goodbye, everybody. All right. Thank you very much for joining us for Kids Goodbye. Corner. Have a Goodbye, great everybody. rest of the service. Bye. Shadow says bye, too. Hello, everyone, and welcome to church. Okay, here we are, week three of Internet Church. So far, so good. We're doing this, we're doing this. Um, I thought I'd start off with uh, Chris Tomlin's My Deliverer this week, because we need some delivering big time. And uh, the truth is, is we will be delivered. This will pass, and uh, we'll be able to meet again all together very soon so here we go might as well sing about it let's do this
salvation, your gates are praise. Your walls are salvation, your gates are praise.
than heaven The creator of all things Who is this king of glory He's everything to me yeah. His name is Jesus Precious The king of my heart, the king of glory. His name is Jesus, precious Jesus, the Lord Almighty, the king of my heart, the king of glory. Like a lot of you, Dave and I have been struggling a little bit to try to keep our boys occupied and entertained during this very weird time when we're all kind of cooped up at home together all the time. And so we've been trying to come up with different things to do. And the other night, uh, for something to for something to do, my mom dropped off an old photo album on our porch for me to look through with the boys together. And this was full of pictures of family vacations that I had taken with my siblings when we were young. And for me, the photo album was a little bit like, um, like looking through a treasure chest. I, uh, I knew I had taken those trips with my family, but I hadn't thought about them in years and years. And my kids' questions were, were sort of helping me to bring those memories back. Like, Mommy, who's that? Oh, that's Uncle Steve. I don't think you've had a chance to meet him. Or, what are you guys doing there? Oh, that's when we went to Prince Edward Island, or when we went to Disney World, or when we drove to Sudbury and we saw the Big Nickel. It's not that I had forgotten that I had taken those trips per se, but it's more like lots of things have happened to me since I was seven or 11 or 14. So those family vacation memories had sort of been packed up in boxes and um, moved to the back of the back room of my brain a little bit. Now, sometimes it's not such a bad thing um, to forget 
or lose track of a memory. For example, those shorts in 2003 were not doing me any favors. I don't mind forgetting those blue shorts. But there are other times when remembering is very, very important. I know that some of you have walked with a parent or a family member through Alzheimer's or dementia, or maybe you're walking that road right now. And um, it's a hard, hard journey. And there are all sorts of dimensions to why, to why that's hard. But one of the things that people have reported to me about walking with a loved one through an illness like this is just this sense that your loved one is not the person that they were before the illness. Memory plays an important part in our identity. Our memories locate us within our own story and our own history, and they also locate us in something bigger than our own story as well. They locate us in a broader context. Our memories both root us in our past and they also um, show us where we are. Uh, and when we know those things, when we know where we've been and we know where we are, it's easier to see where we're going as well. All throughout the Old Testament, God gives his people these tools to help them remember. He gives them instructions for festivals and rituals and prayers that are all designed to help his people remember who they are and what God has done for them. And one of the main ways that God does this in the Old Testament is through story. The Israelites were commanded by God to tell stories. They were commanded to tell stories of how God had been at work in their past. They were supposed to talk about these stories all the time, tell them all the time, especially tell them to their children. Uh, Matt and Star expressed that commitment to Ivy this morning using one of those Old Testament passages from Deuteronomy 6. Israel's cultural memory rooted them in their identity as the rescued people of God. And it was important for the Israelites to remember, not only so that they could kind of look back fondly on the past, but it was also important to remember for the sake of their futures too. When we know where we've been, it's easier to know where we're going. Well, welcome to another edition of Couch Church. Um, the global reality that we're all experiencing right now with COVID-19 means that we can't be together in person right now, unfortunately. But like many churches, we are choosing to reorient together around Jesus by gathering online. And even as we're celebrating and grateful for those technologies that allow us to connect, it's not the same. I know it's not the same. Every pastor or worship leader out there right now singing or preaching to a webcam or every Christian watching church on a screen rather than participating in it live, we all know it's not the same. However, what is the same is that the gospel is still true. And it is so important, maybe especially now, for us to reorient around that truth and around Jesus together. So even while we admit that it's not the same, even while we grieve that a little bit, feel the sadness of that a little bit, thank you for showing up. Thank you for staying home and for doing your part to care for one another in that way. I'm glad that you're with us online this morning or this evening or whenever you're watching this video. And I'm feeling just maybe a teeny tiny bit less awkward about preaching to a camera this week. And maybe you are feeling just a teeny tiny bit less awkward about experiencing church um, this way this week as well. 
believe it or not, we are just one week away from Easter. And it, it doesn't feel that way to me. Maybe it doesn't feel that way to you, but uh, the calendar doesn't lie. Here at Hive, we've been on a journey through the book of Hebrews called Meeting Jesus Again. And even though uh, when we planned this series a long time ago, we did not have any idea what we'd be dealing with this Easter, I have personally been really grateful for an opportunity to dig into the identity and the person of Jesus in these past weeks. Who Jesus is and what he's done and what kind of life he makes possible when we choose to trust him. The book of, in the book of Hebrews, the author is presenting the identity of Jesus, the divine son, almost as though he's holding up a diamond with many different facets. And he's kind of holding up this diamond from different angles so we can admire it from those different angles. Throughout this series, we've been looking at Jesus in different roles that he fills for us, in his role as God's final and most authoritative word to human beings. We've been looking at Jesus in his role as high priest and as the mediator of a new and better covenant between God and his people than what came before. And we've also been looking at Jesus as the only sacrifice which can um, secure permanent forgiveness for us from sin. The author of Hebrews is holding up this diamond, Jesus the high priest, Jesus the rescuer, Jesus the sacrifice, um, and he's doing that for the sake of encouraging his audience. As we've been talking about throughout this whole series, the author, the anonymous author of Hebrews is a leader who writes like a pastor. And his audience likely is a small house church, a small group of believers who were facing really hard circumstances and were feeling tempted to give up. Appropriate, right? <laughs> All throughout Hebrews, the person of Jesus is being kind of unfolded and put on display and, and as that's happening, there's kind of this constant refrain throughout the whole book of, of encouragement. Like, don't give up, keep going, persevere. Last week, we looked at one appeal that the author makes from Hebrews 12. And today, we're going to look at another appeal from Hebrews 10. So recognizing that we're jumping around a little bit in the book. But check it out. Hebrews 10, 19 to 25. Let me just grab my actual Bible here. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. In a lot of ways, um, what we have here in Hebrews, um, in Hebrews 10 is a variation on a theme that we've been seeing all throughout Hebrews. Hold on, persevere, stay the course. The same thing keeps being repeated uh, with different emphases, different ways. Yet as a wise person I know once told me, Repetition plus variety equals learning, and that's what's going on in this passage. Yet another appeal to perseverance. The preacher's focus here is threefold. Draw near to God. Hold on to hope and hold on together. We began our online teaching time this morning by talking about the role that memory plays in shaping our identity. 
And the author begins this passage, this particular call to perseverance by encouraging his people to draw near to God. What the author is doing here is appealing to the memory of this small house church, this small group of believers. He's trying to get them to remember what God has done for them in the past, particularly through the work and person of Jesus, and allow that knowledge to influence their behavior in the present. Now, scholars who study Hebrews have noticed that um, there's a parallel going on in Hebrews between the passage we read today, Hebrews 10, 19 to 25, and an earlier passage, Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. And we actually looked at 4, 14 to 16 on March the 8th, if you were with us in that day, um, on that day in our building. And we used this illustration borrowed from Brene Brown about um, trust being like a marble jar. And we talked about how the incarnation, God becoming a human being, is one really big and significant way that God earns our trust, that God puts marbles in our marble jar. And here in Hebrews 10, the author is again appealing to his congregation's trust in God. He says in 10.22, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and the full assurance that faith brings. Now that word faith is interesting. The concept of faith is an interesting one. When we uh, think about faith in our Western context, we often think about it like a bit of a gamble, you know, or even like a really big risk. We have that English expression, a leap of faith, right? Kind of jumping into the on into the unknown. And yet the biblical understanding that we have of faith is a lot less like jumping off a cliff into the unknown and a lot more like the whole marble jar idea. Faith means remembering what God has done in the past and letting those memories help you trust him in the here and now. In other words, draw near to God, not because your pastor tells you to, not because the author of Hebrews tells you to, but because God has proved himself faithful again and again and again. God was faithful to the people of Israel to rescue and redeem them from their slavery in Egypt. God was faithful to send prophets and leaders to help them follow God's ways, and God was faithful to send Jesus the Messiah. God was faithful to the people of Israel, and God will be faithful to his church as well. Remember how God has come through for you in the past, and rest assured that he will continue to come through for you again. And what was good advice for discouraged Christians during Nero's reign is equally good advice for discouraged Christians during a global pandemic. Draw near to God with full assurance of faith. Remember, trust. Remember what God has done for us in the past and let that motivate you to trust him with the present. As a congregation and even in our own personal lives, God has seen us through some impossibly terrible times. We've gone through tragedies and loss, both as individuals and collectively. We've gone through grief, uncertainty, and heartbreak, yet God has been faithful. Remember, trust. The second thing the author of Hebrews wants to uh, say to his congregation during their struggle, and what I'd like to say to you during all that we're going through right now, is hold on to hope. Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. The Greek word our Bibles translate as hold on is uh, used in the present tense here, indicating that 
holding on is like this active thing. It's, um, it's, it's not something we do passively. It's not something that happens by accident or by default. Holding on to hope in Christ is active and it's work. In a similar way that driving down a straight road requires the driver to make lots of little adjustments to the steering wheel all the time, or like a rock climber needs to keep her grip and be constantly looking out for that next place she's going to put her hands and her feet in a similar way, holding on to our hope in Christ means paying attention. What helps you keep your grip when the winds of discouragement, fear, or anxiety threaten to blow you off course? Well, the author of Hebrews is actually going to answer that question for us in the last part of our passage today, verse 24. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together. As some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. How did discouraged Christians in the first century, possibly in the face of a terrible and bloody persecution, how did they keep their grip? How do we, as we live through this surreal thing called a global pandemic, how do we keep a grip? How do we hold on to hope? Well, among other things, we hold on together. First, let me say that the irony of preaching on a passage that stresses the importance of meeting together, the irony of preaching that from my own house to a webcam rather than to your faces because we can't meet Right now, the irony of that is not lost on me. And yet, even though we can't be together in person, and even though the church, um, even though couch church is not the same, not the same at all as live gathered worship in the same room, even so, I think it's more important than ever that we find ways to hold on to Jesus together. When the author of Hebrews talks about not giving up meeting together, his word for give up could be translated forsake or abandon. There's something about participating, about separating yourself from participating in the worshiping community that the author sees as not just a bad idea, but something that's really fatal to persevering in the Christian life of faith. Following Jesus is not something God ever intended us to do or even attempt to do on our own. And this is just as much a reminder to myself as to anyone. Don't try faith alone. Don't do it. We need encouragement, teaching, rebuke. We need the kind of stuff we can only get from other human believers. We need to be together in community, speaking the words of God to one another, serving and being served, partnering together to share the gospel with the world. The early church, the small congregation um, who were the first recipients of Hebrews, they needed one another to persevere, and we need one another too. This was true before COVID life, and it will be true when this is all over. We need each other. Don't abdicate that responsibility that we have to one another. This begs the question, what does that even look like for us right now? How do we encourage one another and not give up meeting together when we literally can't? meet together in a face-to-face -face kind of way. It's tough. We have never done this before. So we need to get creative. 
I know that there's been a lot of emphasis on technology and internet use these days because it's become a little bit of a lifeline of connecting with one another right now. But it's not the only way. As I've been looking around my neighborhood for ways that people are encouraging each other, I see us kind of moving in two directions at the same time. So on the one hand, there's the tech and internet uh, direction. And, you know, we're using that right now to have our service and that's great. But there's also a much more kind of old fashioned uh, way of connecting. Handmade window signs, cards dropped off on porches, sidewalk chalk messages of hope, porch drop offs of groceries or cookies. There's also the phone and extra points if you have a landline. There are different ways of doing this and not all of them are digital. I can't wait to see your faces again. I can't wait to be with you in person and preach my sermons to you when you're really, when you're really there in front of me. I can't wait until we can stand less than two meters apart from one another. I can't wait until the huggers can hug us again. I look forward to that day, just like I think all of us are. But until then, we need to hold on to hope and we need to hold on together. We need to root ourselves, even if that means doing so remotely, we need to root ourselves in our local expressions of faith. In this case, a local expression of faith called Highview Community Church. How do we do that? How can we still really be part of that local community that's that place where we experience faith? Well, this week, I have an easy and concrete way that you can really be part of our local church. We have just witnessed two courageous sets of parents, Heidi and Eric Munnings and Star and Matt LaFranco, make really brave public promises to raise their children in the way of Jesus. And that is a big, hard job, pandemic or no pandemic. These parents are going to need our support. And as we mentioned um, during those dedications, there is a, a communal um, commitment to dedications in a, usually. So usually we'd be at church and, and the pastor would ask the congregation, do you promise to support these parents as they seek to raise their child up to know the Lord? And you say, we do. Reach out to these parents. Give them a call. Send them a text. Write them a card and put it in the mail. Show them your support. Show them that we are in this together. As a whole culture right now, as a church, but as a nation, as, as an entire planet of people, we're going through this sort of collective trauma right now. Um, and during trauma, our emotional reserves get used up and you might find that your emotional reserves are low these days. Your energy is low. Certainly my my energy and emotional reserves are low right now. But let's muster up what we have, what strength and energy we have, and call somebody. Call someone to say hi. Call someone to say you care about them. Remind each other that he who promised is faithful Remind each other that God has been faithful to us in the past and God will be faithful to us in the future. If you know how to navigate the online world, then great, use those tools. But see if you can find ways to use them not only for your own encouragement, although that's important too, 
but also for the encouragement of others as well. In the church calendar today, um, the Sunday before Easter, this Sunday, is known as Palm Sunday. And it marks Jesus' arrival into Jerusalem where he knew he would meet his death. If you know that story from your Bibles, when Jesus enters the city, his disciples and his followers there throw their cloaks on the road and they cut down palm branches and they welcome Jesus as the coming king. In the years and centuries that followed um, those events, this Sunday has marked the beginning of Holy Week and the events that led up to Jesus' death and resurrection. Here's the thing. What was true that very first Palm Sunday, what was true that the disciples and followers of Jesus declared on that day, what was true for the first recipients of Hebrews is still true. Jesus is still the King. The entire book of Hebrews is a call to persevere, not because we know how everything is going to go down, not because we know what is going to happen next, but because of who Jesus is. The author of Hebrews repeats this call to perseverance and strength in a myriad of ways. Here in Hebrews 10, he reminds us to draw near to God, allowing God's faithfulness in the past to inspire trust in the present. He also reminds us to hold actively on to hope and to do so by holding on together. To remain faithful to the local worshiping community to which he's called us as the place where we get to live out our Christian life together. Next Sunday is Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, and it's going to look different. I want to acknowledge the heartbreak that so many of us, myself included, will be feeling about not being able to celebrate Resurrection Sunday in the same place. Let's make space for that grief. But, and... The resurrection changes everything. The resurrection still changes everything in a deeper and more profound way than a pandemic or any disaster ever could. The resurrection changes everything. We need to remember that. We need to encourage one another. We need to hold on to hope by remembering and celebrating the resurrection together. Let me read our passage for us one more time as, as a benediction, as a blessing over us on this day. Hebrews 10, 19 to 25. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Amen. Thank you for being part of Highview Community Church this morning, even from your own homes. Next week, we are still going to tell the greatest rescue story ever told. We are still going to proclaim the resurrected Jesus. The service will look different, but the story is no less true. See you online next week. Take care.